Welcome to Blue Grit Radio, the podcast that explores making better cops for a better community. I'm your host, Eric Tong. I've been an active police officer since 2007. We will dive into the aspects of police culture, health and wellness, leadership, and mindset. You'll hear from experts not only from policing, but all industries as they relate to being our best with purpose, passion, and positivity. Join me as we share stories, lessons, and advice so we can all be better for ourselves, our teams, our families, and our communities. All right, everybody, welcome back to Blue Grit Radio. This is your host, Eric, and joining me today is Daniel, Zaya, Joseph. Dan, thanks for being on the show today. Thanks for having me, man. Finally, yeah, man. it happened. Yeah, I appreciate yeah. it, man. Uh, we got Dan here. He's a veteran, U.S. Army vet, author of several books, and we're going to get into that. But you know, he reached out to me because of a lot of the work he's doing in mental health support for veterans, in building resilience, mindset. All these things are extremely pertinent to our audience, which is largely first responders, veterans, and people that just want to function at their best to help others. I really appreciate you being on. Just kind of want you to have the opportunity to introduce yourself a little bit to the audience before we get into it. Yeah, man. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I was uh, in the Army as a combat engineer. I was a platoon leader. I had an opportunity during COVID, during the pandemic and the lockdowns to uh, really focus on mental health while being a leader because you know, the entire world was suffering with that, right? And so being in a military environment, training in austere environments just made it that much more of a difficult situation. And so it really bonded us together because we're all stuck in the middle of nowhere sometimes and gave me a, a deep perspective on, man, just what it looks like to be in the service, to be struggling with stuff just from normal life, but also the stress of the job and then just mission sets, just training over and over for high stress environments, right? So we're kind of factoring in getting tactical training, but on top of that, taking care of one another in a real way. I had a soldier survive a suicide attempt my last week as platoon leader, and then he really, he's still alive and well, but he inspired me to write the book as I just kind of processed some stuff that I was going through. At the same time, a buddy of mine, Austin, he lost uh, 13 men from his unit to suicide after Afghanistan, which is just insane. It's just absolutely like, heartbreaking to hear that. Quite unfathomable, to be honest. So that was kind of the normal, if you will, for some people that I was working with. But it's it's def- definitely there, you know, it's in the background. So trying to make the world a better place, help leaders be educated on their way in, and especially men talk about mental health issues. Yeah, that's huge. And I love the fact that you roll in the leadership component to that and then the heightened awareness because of those working around you and under you, alongside you with these mm-hmm. these critical issues. You know, certainly it was only by my exposure to the job that made me even aware and start to learn more about mental health, peer support, some of these things. It's not like I grew up as a kid with, uh, with emotional awareness or mental health awareness or as a young man. So I love that aspect. I did want to ask you um, some things kind of leading up to joining the military. What brought you to the U.S. Army? Army to their doorstep. Uh-huh. Really what, what it boiled down to was, I mean, I joined at 32. So I was sitting here joining. I'm in San Diego. I had the pleasure of meeting a bunch of friends who are in the military here, a lot of different branches. Mm-hmm. Um, several guys who really influenced my life were Navy SEALs. And there's some EODs as well, and some pilots. And when I met them, I had just kind of left the party scene because I was drinking a lot. I was around drugs. I was I was just in an environment where it was a lot of self-medication, a lot of dissociation, escaping. Um, I started meeting these guys when I, I wanted to like leave the party scene and sober up and find some some solid influences. And then I started talking to these guys, and then they were they were shipping out quite frequently on multiple deployments back to back. The op tempo was really high. My family's from my parents are from Iraq. We call it Iraq. And these guys were telling me about like mission sets that they were having to go do, you know, in, in the villages that my folks grew up, grew up in. And I felt just, man, like a lot of gratitude, a lot of awe for the fact that these people are going out, these men and women are going out there to potentially lay down their lives for people they don't really know or anything or owe anything. And my parents just raised us to understand how blessed we are to live in America, man, just to have the freedom we have, the protection that we have, because the stuff they had to witness as kids pretty scary. I mean, it, was, it got life and death very frequently and, and just ex- spontaneously. If, if things went down, you wouldn't get a warning. It would just be people dying, people revolting, a lot of turmoil. And so I just was always taught, you know, mom and dad escaped this. Don't ever go back. Don't ever look back. And I had friends who were shipping out there quite frequently. That kind of, I guess a bit of survivor's guilt, if you will, or I don't know, mm-hmm. like first child immigrant guilt. I'm like, hey, I should probably do something to say thank you to my country for 
letting me have the life that I had. So that all fed into it. But it was definitely when like ISIS was at an all time high because that's my bloodline, my you know, people, if you will, that they were going after over there. A lot of feelings, a lot of emotions there and a lot of gratitude for the service members who were rocking and rolling. Yeah, they witnessed heavy stuff for sure, but they had a heart to just go back. And the more people they lost and the more dudes that got hurt, the more it compelled them to to fight harder and get the mission done. And it was just something something amazing to see. And it was inspiring to me. So I just wanted to enter a life in, like that where I could have some discipline, I could have some some better influences around me and then pay back, you know, in whatever way I could. I love that. Being the son of immigrants as well from China and Taiwan, I try to reflect quite a bit on what being American, right? Being born in as a citizen, being able to inherit all these these opportunities is. And so, you know, without further delay, I want to say thank you for your service. And I know that there's a lot of listeners that'll feel exactly that way, right? Because there are so many ways to look at it. And I'm curious how your family felt, your parents specifically about you deciding to embark on your military career. Yeah, my mom wasn't too happy about it. Uh, Mm -hmm. My brother's a Marine, and that was hard enough in the family when he did his deployments um, Mm -hmm. to the Middle East. And then when I joined, it just kind of further added another layer of fear of what's going to happen. I actually never deployed, though. I was part of a non-deployable unit. So go figure, when I signed a contract, I was hoping to go overseas. And then I mm-hmm. ended up getting stationed in a non-deployable unit. Didn't even know those existed. And um, yeah, so that was kind of a bummer because I really wanted to see if, I don't know, I could apply like linguistic skills or something, but it didn't work out that way. But just signing the contract added a lot of uncertainty because that's how the military is. You never know when you're going to get shipped where, what unit's going to get pulled in. Uh, there's just so much, I don't want to call it volatility because I think it's more organized than that. There's just, they're ready to to adapt to what what happens. I mean, and so different units would deploy different areas and, and whatnot, and spin up for different mission sets. So that was um, an impact on the family. But I mean, again, I was 32 when I joined, so it's definitely not as bad as if I was like 18. I find it so courageous when, like, when I was a platoon leader and I talked to my Joes, I'm just like, man, you guys, like, had the courage to join at 18 years old. It took me way longer than that just to have, like, yeah, almost twice as long just to have the courage to join. Yeah, there's so much you're you're laying on the line potentially because you really don't know where they're going to put you and what the mission the needs of the military will be. For me, it's it's more like a yes and. It is super impressive to me when young men and women sign up and they have their whole lives ahead of them. And mm-hmm. so many things that you know you or I might say, man, I, I really hope that they can experience all these things that, you know, especially I'm 38 now, right? And I, so I feel like I've been able to experience a lot of life and I'm very grateful for that. Um, whereas a lot of these quote unquote kids, like they haven't really had their chance yet. You know, God forbid something happens to them, but you know that something awful will happen to many of them. However, I think that there is something very impressive, not just to build you up, but you know, to once you get in a track, it's harder to move off that track, right? So if your track is to not enlist or not join any, you know, service related thing, by the time you're in your early 30s, like, it's hard for a lot of people to adapt and make change. I think it takes a really big gut check when you have experienced some things and you have the opportunity to get, we could say comfortable, we could say whatever, but then to make that switch where when you're a grunt, you're a grunt. It definitely resonates with me when you're talking about how you sign up for these altruistic reasons and you picture just yourself being deployed and to do the thing and prove the thing. I think that's a, a big part of what a lot of us seek as men. There's certainly an aspect of me that wanted that when I signed up for this law enforcement thing. And to not get that, I could that resonates with me, you know, to be kind of bittersweet, perhaps, you know, it's brought you here. And so I know that, you know, with what you talk about and spirituality and, and purpose, I'm sure that it's been something that you've probably been able to digest quite a bit better over the last few years. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And I, I am looking into like, some other military contracts on the side so I can actually maybe get a chance to deploy because it's definitely an itch I want to scratch and something I still feel I still feel some sort of magnetism to it so yeah I'm out of active duty now but I have a friend right now who's in Iraq and it's just it's wild bro like I'm you know I text messaging him to make sure he's alive and well through I mean whatever's going on in the headlines right now the news isn't always super accurate which is nice but uh but yeah there's still you don't say it's it's just interesting having friends there when I see a headline I'm like dude my buddy's there right now it's that feeling just of again gratitude and then I should be there like I'd like to go help if I can if I could rewind a little bit to what you're talking about with regards to COVID clearly that had such an impact on everybody in the world to some degree you know as far as like mental stress could you unpack that a little bit more and like how that affected you and your unit those around you in that time the whole military just had like a stop movement 
So a lot of guys were slotted for ranger school and sapper school and all this different fun stuff. I was trying to get into the dive program uh, as an army engineer. And we were all training up for our respective schools, schoolhouses. And then for about a year, we couldn't go. Um, and so all the guys who had hard slots lost those hard slots. And then other, the new classes took them. And it just was this big ordeal. Just the, the pressure of not being able to leave certain places. Like, again, depending on the base you're at. So certain army bases aren't typically in, like, the greatest spots. Navy definitely has phenomenal bases. I was going like, to say San lockdowns. Diego. Like, you're, yeah, you're, you're meeting everyone there. And there's worse places. <sighs> Dude, my, my buddies who were locked down here, like, they were at the beach. They are having fun. Mm -hmm. uh, all the restaurants were open outside. I was on a desert base in the middle of nowhere. So there was literally nothing, dude. It was just all sand. So um, there was like a fob, basically. And uh, yeah, so that was rough because the soldiers, you know, they need time to decompress. They need, you know, we joined the military to be physical. And so when, you know, workouts were impacted and the PT program was impacted and, um, there's just like again for me we were on a very austere base and so there there weren't many places to go decompress so self-medication shot up through alcohol a lot of people relapsed uh, who had sobriety people who, who were drinking tended to drink alone it's oftentimes and then get to it was, it was heavy my role without trying to be too much of like grandpa or father it was just telling my soldiers like you know pursue education work on goals like i get it it sucks right now but you got to find ways to optimize your life you know do your workouts meditate make your room like super zen super peaceful work on your sleep hygiene stuff like that i was trying to just encourage them to to feed their souls and their minds to enrich their lives i signed up for a master's in psych while i was in so that kind of gave me even more vocabulary and context to describe you know, feelings and emotions and neurophysiological responses to stress and whatnot. And it helped me also navigate the, the PTS of people around me so I can see the manifestations of what was going on while working. Um, but yeah, it, the lockdowns just kind of amplified mental health issues uh, or it amplified resilience, capability to have resilience, which is why I decided to write on that topic because you you either had to really be for it or it, you were just going to get smashed with a tsunami of it's during the lockdowns. Yeah. And that's huge. And I, I love how you, you focus on that, right? Like the hardship forces two things. It, it, it makes the pressure makes people crumble a bit, or it creates that opportunity to foster resilience. Um, you mentioned a lot of things are obviously super helpful, you know, for your soldiers, right? Um, getting some Zen time, right, where they can focus on themselves, decompress, sleep hygiene. We talked about that on, on the show a couple of times, but can you talk a little bit about that if someone's not listened to this before and they're like, what is that phrase? How do you put those two words together? What does that even mean? Cut me off if I get too nerded out over this, but essentially if we're looking at melatonin secretion prior to the sleep cycle, if we're looking at getting actual deep REM sleep, there's like biologically, we have to go to bed at the same time every day because our, our hormonal levels will modify themselves according to sunset, or at least according to when we downregulate our nervous system and prepare for bed. Mm -hmm. So what's super important is to cut out, cut out any sort of um, stimulants that, and I'm not talking just caffeine or anything like that, but I'm talking about stimulating you know cell phones everyone well, i'm sure at this point we all know about blue light frequencies and versus like you know the warmer frequencies and what mm -hmm. and the light but also conversations and people who rev up our nervous system who get us anxious or hyper vigilant little triggers like that which is difficult in the military when you're on 24-hour standby to run run ops and run training simulations that's really difficult because the second your phone goes off you don't know if it's your commander you don't know if it's the you know the sergeant the ncos whoever it is you got to like jump to your phone and we technically were never allowed to like switch our phones off because if you did and we got recalled for something, it's just, you know, people are pounding on your door, you know? And then if you look at not just the mental part, but if we look at the physiological part of the body, the best way to get to REM sleep, if, if you can set your room temperature to like 60 to 65 degrees, take a hot shower or a, I mean, a hot bath is even better, but you get your skin temperature very hot. And then when the heat dissipates from your body, into like the sheets or into the ambient temperature of the room because of the delta of like what 40 to 50 degrees the the heat dissipating off of your skin is what gets you into a deep sleep faster 
It's mm-hmm. not that um, the room is just cold. It's really important because again, I would see, you know, hear people talk about drinking alcohol and stuff to go to bed, like literally taking shots to go to bed. I did that too, by the way. I partied a lot before I joined the military. I was drinking six days a week, blacked out regularly, man, like seven shots, eight shots before I go to the bars. Like I was that guy. A lot of that had to do with my own anxiety and my own issues. So I was trying to actually downregulate my nervous system by drinking alcohol, which actually doesn't work. You don't feel that you're upregulated, but you, you actually don't resolve any sort of those issues. I think sleep hygiene is a, is a very honest litmus test of do you or do you not have a, a, a lower baseline of anxiety than you should. Uh, truth yeah. is like sleep is the ultimate like truth because it's hard to sleep if you have a lot of anxiety. That was a money explanation for what we're talking about. And then a lot of these tangible things that we can affect, right? Hard for military, right? Where you're always on call. Hard for cops that you're always on call or firefighters, right? You're literally sleeping at the station, potentially hypervigilant enough to be woken up. I know what that's like to a smaller degree where I'm not on call frequently. But if I am, I I know I'm not really getting good sleep because I'm terrified to sleep through my thing and be that guy. Like, I don't want to be that guy. So my ringer's on all the time. Anytime I get up, I'm checking it, right, to make sure I didn't miss something and double checking it. So I feel you on that. That's a tough one, though, right? Like the people you're around because you're in a unit. You don't get to really choose your boss. You don't get to choose the people you're around. Anything pop in your mind at how people can help navigate that? One of the chapters in my book is, is about is about advice from my buddy, Will. He's a Marsoc Marine. They're, they're spec ops community. And he, uh, before I joined, he told me that command climate will dictate everything. It'll, it'll make or break your unit. So if you go in with a good boss, it's going to be a good time. If you go in with a bad boss, it's going to be a bad time. And unfortunately, mm-hmm. there's not much you can do about it because whoever is in that position, their personality traits, trickle. it'll have a trickle effect. It's just the way that rank structure works. They, they set the tone. They set the culture. There's a lot of yes men who will then just sort of emulate that and, and mimic that. I think also at a subconscious level as well, if we look into, man, if you want to dig into aspects of codependency and stuff like that, there's a lot of issues that where, where people will just simply mirror who's on top with, without objectively weighing if, if it's efficient or if it's going to be counterproductive to the organization. They'll just say, my boss is like this, so I'm going to be like this. And I think a lot of times it's if, especially worse if people say, well, the better my boss, the more my boss likes me, the more we align, then the more chances I have of promoting. Could be that. Mm-hmm. You'll see that trickle effect um, everywhere. His advice was if you do go into a situation where it's not optimal, it's not ideal leadership, you have to just uh, do what you can to weather that storm. And then eventually the leader will switch out or you'll move to a different unit. And then, you know, hopefully when you roll the dice, you get a great leader, you know? And so, um, yeah, that's why resilience is huge. Because if you are in a situation where you're not being nurtured, if you will, or enriched by your leadership, you're not being poured into, you're not being mentored, you got to find a way to to do that for yourself and do that for those around you. Um, while at the same time, getting drained, potentially. By, by folks mm-hmm. around you. Um, that's the difficult part is you're not, it's not just a neutral environment. It could be a bad environment that drains you. And then, you know, your family is going to feel that your spouse, your children, your roommates, whoever it is, will feel that as well. So it's so important to, to work on growing yourself, recharging yourself, like self-care, all that stuff, and then making the most of the situation as well, or just simply surviving. Some, some people in the military, they're, depending on their unit and the situation, the mission. Some some friends of mine I've known to be strictly on survival mode for like months and months and months at a time, which is difficult. But then there's other other environments where it's like the best situation ever. I mean, they're getting the jobs they want. They're getting the schools they want. They're getting the promotions. They like, it's it's just really like, it, it's a big, it's a big world out there. And there, you, you'll never know until all of a sudden you're in your unit and then you'll you'll figure it out on the fly. Yeah, for sure. You know quickly without having to think much about it. Like, do you have good leadership or do you not? It's not like you have to disparage it, but like, is it a supportive culture or not? I like to flip it where you can't control your boss, but you can work on yourself, right? You can take ownership of certain things you can build your resilience. I like to flip where, hey, you're partially responsible for the culture you're part of, whether it's your peers or trying to lead up. There have been times where, you know, I got, I was listening to a lot of Jocko and I was like extreme ownership and I was trying to lead up. And I was taking that on maybe a little unrealistic, really, right? Like uh, where I was like, man, if my boss doesn't see it this way, then like, that's on me. And I would caution people to to not venture down that path too far. 
maybe flip it more on like, hey, how can I create positivity within myself and my guys? And there is something to be said for you saying, hey, weather the storm, because timing just happens sometimes on its own. And if you keep working on yourself and your guys and trying to float, just staying as positive as practical, then that can do a lot too. And I mean, they did tell us like, hey, the war is going to suck. So what you're experiencing right now, consider that you're figuring it out, like how to handle a crappy situation. Because if we do deploy, if things go down, then what do you got? All you got is the people next to you and your attitude. And so that was, that was one way of looking at it for sure. You know, and it doesn't mean you go around like super fake, like, oh yeah, everything's great. This is awesome. It's like, no, things definitely suck, but you know what? We have each other. So let's be good to each other, you know, mm-hmm. um, or at least if we can't be good to each other because we're so exhausted, let's not be bad to each other. You know, we got that in the weeds with it. About your guy that attempted suicide and fortunately is still with us. And then mm-hmm. also uh, your buddy losing many of his men. What are some of the lessons that you'd like to share with leaders as we talk about these industries that are prone towards uh, depression and suicide, such as? the military community, such as first responders. I mean, do what you can to remove the stigma. If you have a couple, all it takes is a couple of good dudes who've been there who will talk about it and just the waterworks will come out. You give people a space, you know, not in a huge group, but break, have a little breakout, have a little conversations with people. But when you have a rank structure that stifles real conversation, that's not good. I mean, there's got to be moments where you're giving people a voice regardless of rank. Because if they have stuff to share, I mean, you could have an 18-year-old kid in someone's eyes, which really they're an adult because they sign a contract to potentially lose their life in war. But you have an 18-year-old who's got more wisdom than 40-year-old, right, who's experienced stuff. Like one of my best friends, I just talked to him the other day. We went to basic training together. He got out as an E4. He's training up to, to hopefully get in the NFL because I told him he's going to help me retire once mm, he gets in. But anyway, he's a, he's a good dude. Man, his mom uh, does drugs. So as an 18-year-old kid, he had to fight off meth dealers coming after his mom and hurting his mom and he's 18 years old and he joined the army to protect people and he's got a huge heart dude the guy's got a huge heart like another one of my soldiers he's like hey sir you want to see something you want to see something crazy and i'm like what's up man so he sh- showed me his phone i was like hey look look at this and it was like this just it looked like a demolition site like just wall like literal walls just holes in the wall and broken like a dresser that was just smashed i'm like dude what what the heck's that He's like, this is what my stepdad did to my mom. And he said, I had to join the army. So I didn't kill him because gra- he like grabbed a knife and was going to like literally kill this guy for hurting his mom, you know? And so he was 18 years old. He joined the military just so he wouldn't like legit commit homicide protecting his mom from abuse, right? Th- these are soldiers that somebody else would say like, oh, hey, shut up. What's your rank? Like, you don't know anything. I'm like, bro, do you realize what this guy's experienced in his life? You'll never know the trauma this dude experienced as a teenager. And so that's when I realized you can't pull rank on people. If they have a heart to share stuff, you got to let them share it. And it's when people say like, oh, keep your mouth shut. I don't want to hear from you. You're not important. That's when people are driven to suicide because there's a culture being created. You're not allowed to speak up because you didn't earn it yet. And that's not right. Mm -hmm. You know? And so when people can let go of their ego and just say, let's like, I'll meet you where you're at. Like you can share what's going on. It's amazing. But, but that's again, and I'll shut up after this. That's where rank is used to say like, you better know your place. And the mm. people that over rely on rank to do that, dude, it creates a massive fallout, man. And what sucks is they don't know it. You know, oftentimes people are like, dude, don't you know what it's like to have somebody treat you rudely? You would think that they would just not be a jerk to other people. But you just see people, they get ranked, they get authority, and all of a sudden they're a jerk. And it's, but I was really close to my soldiers and I don't care. A lot of people were annoyed by it. It's like, you're not supposed to be that close to your Joes, but it's a lockdown. People are committing suicide. I'm not going to, I'm not going to push them away from me if they want to share what's going on in their lives. But that's what I want to see more in the military is people who are willing to have those real talks, you know? And not to sound cheesy, but every talk that happens is propelling the opportunity for more talks, right? The fact that you can remove that with your guys, those guys are going to come up. They're going to be leaders and they're going to be of that culture, right? I like to think that there's more of our generation that are going to be moving into those formal or informal positions where you remove that stigma just by officializing some of the support, by talking about it pretty avidly. Not to be like, look at me, but I thought about like how I wanted to share that I've used utilized therapy and how I've utilized different kinds of support networks. And I'm like, well, I'm just going to say it because for someone, not because I'm anything special, but for someone, that's going to be a hurdle removed because tongue does it. You know, for someone, they look up to me in some way. I appreciate you sharing that simple message. You want to talk about the newest book that has just uh, released? 
it was, it was the newest one. The rucksack should have been the one I reached out about originally, but okay. I may have told you about the combat. The combat psych handbook is like a boiled down version of the, the backpack to rucksack. Book. That one's more of like terminology, psychological mm-hmm. terminology, and very short like exercises, practical exercises people could do as if they got it from a therapist on varieties of issues. So it's like an A to Z book. Um, it's actually dedicated to a, a soldier who died. Uh, Jeremiah, he's, you can read his story. It's pretty. It's a pretty sad story. But um, he died after war in Afghanistan. Um, and his mom, she's a gold star mother, Tammy. She wrote the foreword to the book. It's free on my website. If you go to my website, you can look at the book for free, cover to cover, because it's supposed to be a resource, especially for men who struggle with mental health issues. Uh, because I geared it towards men because they, the suicide rate is so much higher for dudes and we tend to lack emotional vocabulary um, and the capacity to discuss feelings as readily as, you know, the female population. And so, um, yeah, so, and, and that's a, a distilled version of Backpack to Rucksack. Backpack to Rucksack is more of like a storyline of different characters, but they're real people who inspired me and hmm. nuggets of wisdom they shared. So those are the two like military esque ones, and then there's a jujitsu book I wrote on my grad school thesis. Yeah, is that black belt mindset? Yeah, you know we talk about focusing on on men's mental health, and of course it's not to box out women, but it is a different dynamic. And you talk about the stats, and we talked a little bit about some of the stigmas in your studies. I'm curious. I heard something recently, and I, I wish I could look it up because I tried to cite it, and uh, recently in conversation I couldn't actually remember where it came from. But it was this notion that boy children are much more emotional or they have, you know, maybe more emotional peaks as far as trying to control and trying to express themselves, but having difficulty with that than little girl children. Mm -hmm. However, a lot of our society would label women as more emotional and maybe give them some of the tools as to express that and nurture that or kind of navigate that. Whereas for boys, it's just, you know, quote unquote, boys being boys and trying to encourage them to subdue. Does that align with anything that you you learn in your studies or anything that you discuss? I mean, I haven't studied too much about psychological development other than like an undergrad class. I mean, I know there's there's dynamics that are different. I mean, a lot of uh, conversation goes around what's nature versus nurture for sure. Uh, but if you look at there's different developmental cycles of the mind and like hormonal changes as well, that, that plays a big part. It's like a super convoluted discussion to have. But I know from my own personal development, it's kind of where I sort of like develop my thesis from what I experienced as a kid and the struggles I've had, especially with like uh, not having a good relationship with my dad, at least not the relationship I wanted. Mm-hmm. I mean, he was a loving father and, and as much as he could be with the knowledge that he was given, especially coming from his background and the trauma that they had and just the environment, um, the lack of psychological tools, that that really played a big part in some of the, the ego deficits I had and the co- the compensatory mechanisms that I had that stemmed from childhood. Mm-hmm. And then as I became an adult, would basically develop self-medicated processes around those those wounds psychologically. Yeah, that that's kind of a big picture of kind of my life. And then a lot of what I've learned, especially about male psychology, comes from jujitsu just picking good sparring partners or seeing people's aggression level and how they handle aggression. And I mean, I've, I've rolled with females as well. It's just a different dynamic. Um, but when it's, when you roll with another dude, whatever his issues are, are going to come out on him. So if he has emotional intelligence, it's going to be a pretty chill role or technical role, or at least if it is explosive and violent, it's done with like intelligence behind it versus somebody who hasn't been, um, taught how to emotionally regulate they'll be just straight up violent they'll be aggressive they'll use too much force they'll be compensating and it won't be jujitsu at that point it's going to be a street fight Mm -hmm. so it's it um jujitsu was a laboratory for me to have an actual hands-on lesson on what psychological like equilibrium looks like or equanimity where people are just even healed versus somebody who's not able to self-regulate. And that's myself as well. Like my anxiety would spike. I've had panic attacks. I've had just, there's, there's been so much that jujitsu has done for me to expose my struggles. And mm-hmm. then also at the same time, give me an environment where I can take what I learned from like the therapy office or whatever, come to the mats and then remember how to breathe it out, how to have a conversation about it, things of that sort. Yeah, on your website, you talked a little bit about how jujitsu helped you recognize some of the traumas that may have been covered over 
not the same, but I, you know, I want to kind of ask you about how maybe a lot of law enforcement professionals and military are apprehensive of jujitsu because they don't want to be exposed, you know, as far as their abilities, you know, sh- a shattering to the ego, because when they go out, they have to imagine they're going to be safe. They have to recognize that they're going to be capable. What would you say to those individuals that are super hesitant? It's really for people to understand, like exposure therapy is supposed to be little by little. And I didn't realize how I did jujitsu. So I had full fledged, again, like full fledged panic attacks from some stuff that happened to me during childhood. So I would say this is where emotional intelligence is really important. Like find coaches, find people in your life who you can be super honest with about what's going on, but who won't push you out of that comfort zone too, too quickly, right? Somebody where you can expose your darkest secrets to and who will still like want to be there for you and have the capacity to be there for you. But it's a super valid fear or super valid concern to not want to just, you know, go get punched in the face or go get choked out. But it does help in a lot of ways. It helped me. So, um, but there, for instance, like at our, at the gym, there's like an all female class, right? There's, so no guys are allowed to roll and with the females. And so that's, there, we do have co-ed rolling. We do have mats where, you know, we roll guys and girls, mm-hmm. but there's, one class and, and imagine the value of that for like, say if a woman's experienced, you know, uh, physical abuse or sexual assault or something mm-hmm. in her life, then when she does jujitsu, she can do it just with females. And then the, the coach is highly intelligent when it comes to these things um, and can work, work, work with them and get them the help they need while teaching them those techniques. And then there's classes, uh, there's not classes just for veterans, but there's a lot of vets who roll and who are coaches as well. And so if they notice somebody struggling, especially after getting out of the military, that coach can pull that person aside and say, hey, we're going to do a one-on-one roll together. Nobody else. And we could talk about what's going on. There's these really cool aspects of it. As long as you find those people or you filter for them, but if you just go in blindly and somebody doesn't know your issues, like for me, if I went in with my high anxiety, then I accidentally get like elbowed in the face or scratched or whatever it is, I'm going to go ballistic, right? And so Mm -hmm. it was super important for me to like keep those people at arm's length. And if someone's like, hey, I want to spar, I want to blow, I'm like super aggressive. It's like, no, not rolling with you. But then I'd go roll with an upper beltman who's looking after me, who who understands what I'm going through. And, and uh, now I'm at a place, thankfully, um, where I can I can handle a lot more than I thought I ever could. And it was because I found some some good brothers on the mats who would work with me. It's only as helpful as it is healthy for you, if that makes sense. Because you can go to a gym, find an unhealthy environment, it's just going to aggravate your issues. But if you can find a healthy way to to throttle it, it'll really pay dividends. That's huge. I think a more physical, or maybe just a different type of physical example is you know people talking about CrossFit. People have such a love hate on CrossFit. It's like, is CrossFit good for you? Is it gonna smash your joints? I'm like, depends, right? It depends on you. Where are you at? And then it depends on your coach and the gym culture. Like CrossFit could be fantastic for people. I like clowning on it just because I come from more of a traditional bodybuilding background as far as like what I enjoyed and then moving into you know functional movement whatever that even means because that's like a spectrum in itself it, I think it just speaks uh, so much to the importance of a strong leader a good dynamic leader and that's what a coach is right a coach a gym owner you know professor what have you is a leader and that emotional intelligence yeah we could talk about this we could do a whole episode on emotional intelligence for leadership but you know, we talk about the military or law enforcement there often is no correlation as far as you know emotional intelligence and then people being put in charge of other people and we're in the people business like all of us are so it's kind of crazy uh, to me that's the game changer if you have a professor or gym owner that's recognizing the body language and the demeanor of different students and saying, oh, I need to step in, interject, make this swap, or I need to kind of alter this scenario here. Most intelligence is a dynamic concept because every person can have a customized, tailored approach. And the question is, how do you both handle people as individuals? But then again, the mission, right? The mission is just very black and white. We got to go from, you know, from A to B, or we got to do this. Like, But then how do you execute? And it's all in the execution. You know? And in the military, they say that leadership is an art and a science. So there's definitely a scientific approach to leadership, which is, you know, a rank structure or the SOP, the manual, getting, you know, this amount of movement in this time frame. Like it's super simple. But the art of it is you got multiple units, you got different people with different cultural backgrounds, different communication styles, different patience levels and capacities mm-hmm. and aptitudes. And you've got to make this whole thing work to get the mission done. 
The guns all fire the same way. The vehicles hopefully drive the same way unless they're broken and busted up. But the people are all different and unique. There's a reason why there's millions of books on this stuff because there's no black and white answer. But it's just a really exciting conversation space. People might read a book. They might listen to a TED Talk and be like, man, that that really hits. And then it doesn't mean, though, that you can apply that just exactly as the speaker you know, spoke it. And a lot of this has to do with like abandonment issues and rejection issues and attachment issues from childhood. Because as, a, as adults, we just there's a great saying that like adults are just you know bigger children. Basically, mm. we're we're all still kids at heart. And so, uh, you know, if somebody grew up in a very unstable house and, and there's a lot of uncertainty and there's a lot of abandonment, well, an employer giving like you know a performance plan or whatever to improve them, like a counseling statement as we call it in the military. If you do that, that could be just a complete abandonment that they project out. Happening, and so they might self sabotage, they might self destruct, they might just become hateful and internalize, or whatever it is. Um, whereas somebody who doesn't have those issues would just look at it like, Oh, cool, Roger that. Okay, so just don't do that next time. Cool. So it really, and you know, it depends on I think how that would manifest is the amount of rumination. If somebody ruminates on something way too much, there's a trauma, a wound that that hit from earlier in life, probably, but mm. um. Depending on how early, I don't know, but it's really you know dependent on that human being. Um, you know, all different life experiences, but that's one thing I realized is, yeah, just uh, how you talk about the job to people, or you know, it's it's oftentimes it's it's not the job that's complicated; it's the people. Well, like we are complicated as human beings, mm-hmm. and that's okay. That's just how we are. That's that's reality of a biological organism that's experiential. You know, our neurons are amazing things, and with neuroplasticity. We're constantly reinforcing, you know, good and bad behaviors and survivalistic mechanisms. But I mean, how many leaders have like a PhD in psychology, right? So it's it's like you, you can look at someone and say that person is quote crazy. Okay, well, what type of crazy is it? Abandonment crazy, rejection crazy, you know, hypervigilant crazy. Like, there's just the more high res we can get with this with the terminology we have, the more we're able to to save lives and save mental health. Leadership is knowing your people, right? And you're talking about this like clinical level of like knowing your people. And, and some people, if you build a relationship, they will share some of that, right? It's not to say, hey, like get close to people, share their dirt. No, no. Like I have guys that they, they've told me like their hardship and I can see sometimes how it lands with something that, that I've experienced or a, a trend I've experienced where I've been able to connect deeply with some of some of my team that have some of the same kind of neurotic tendencies or some of the same negative self-talk because I'm, I feel like I'm speaking to myself, right? A lot of times you hear the saying where you're most able to help your, your younger self or your earlier version of yourself, right? Like that's how, that's the energy you naturally create and put out. So uh, no, I well, love so, that, man. Yeah. What's really cool is when you learn to navigate that and I'm still working on this. I, you know, like I started doing this, doing this a little bit in the military, not to like toot my own horn. I did get, you know, study psychology. When you when you help maneuver something for somebody that they don't have uh, terminology for, they don't have mm. vocabulary for you. To so just remove stress from people that you, you don't have to tell them. You don't have to say like, "Oh, I'm going to do this because you know I know that you struggle with other issues." It's just, just more of like watch the way your your tone is, or your body language, or the nonverbals. And I'm not saying necessarily coddle people or walk on eggshells, but it's kind of a variation of that mm. where you where you're just a little bit more considerate. Just be kind to people, have some humility, you know? Yeah, isn't that the beauty of it? And like, maybe for some people, they need to hear the almost dissertation of like, why you should be just nicer to people. Yeah, it makes sense. And this is why it makes sense. Because being being nice looks soft. And when you're a soldier, you don't want a bunch of soft soldiers, you know, going to war because war is hard. But if you look at the neurophysiological aspect of what kindness looks like, what humility looks like, that's a more resilient mind. That's a more focused and present mind. So they will be more lethal in war. They will be more decisive. They will be more dedicated to the mission because they're not distracted. And so I understand that it takes, again, like you said, the dissertation look to say like, well, why should I be nice? Okay, well, the nicer you are, the more effective, you know, the killing machine is going to be or the more effective, if it's not a killing mission, then the more methodical they will be and the less catastrophic damage they're going to lay behind, right? And so, and I think that's where, especially, especially guys, we got to realize like there's there's a point to being nice to people and look being nice doesn't mean you're just weak being nice there's different ways of doing this there's hard love there's tough love out there you know and again look at the mats in jiu-jitsu if you're gonna like have a sparring partner that you want to train up or mma fight or whatever it is you know like you can beat the crap out of each other 
but but not in a way that hurts and damages each other's bodies in a way that gets you that muscle memory you have. So when they're in the middle of a heated fight, they're able to stay technical in that fight and not go into a panic. And that doesn't look weak at all. That's it's a very loud fight. It's a very aggressive fight, but but there's again there's kindness to it. You're not mm-hmm. breaking your buddy's elbow with an arm bar, not because you're weak, but because you're smart and you want your buddy to be able to win his upcoming competition. No, that's great. Uh, it reminds me of the the toggle between uh, and we we interplayed kind and nice, but you know nice sometimes people it could be dancing around the issue, whereas just like on the mats with your with your buddy, it's accountability, right? You're keeping each other accountable to be the best you can. And oftentimes being kind comes with it. Things that don't sound nice, right? You could be kind and compassionate and say, hey, man, real talk, like you're letting the guys down. You know, you're letting your team down. Let's let's figure out a plan to help you get there, right? So that's like, mm-hmm. hey, you're not alone and I'm going to coach you up and you know, we're on board together. That could be, it doesn't feel nice, but it is certainly being honest and being direct, which we could all use more of, especially in these in these team dynamics. Yeah, definitely. One thing you could do that's like real great, especially on the mats, is if somebody, let's say somebody's like, keeps elbowing you in the face or something, or is just like really, really rigid. So every time they do a move, they're like, you know, they're exerting way too much force. You could tell them like, hey, bro, you're really sucking at this. Let me help you not suck when you do this move, okay? Um, and the reason why that's nice and kind is because the next dude he rolls with, who he's just training with, he's not going to injure that guy. He's mm-hmm. not going to hurt him. It's going to be more efficient, more technical. So, And that's very assertive. It's very direct. Um, it's not avoidant. It's not dancing around the sub. You're just nailing it, but then you're saying, but let me help you. Like, yeah. I'm not just going to, I'm not just going to say you suck. I'm taking my ball and going home. It's like, no, dude, I want you to be better sparring partner. You know, when you choke me out, I don't want you to break my jaw. I want you to just do a blood choke. That's like a big thing. So when people do a rear naked choke, they'll friggin' when they're, when they're new, they'll grab your jaw, they'll smash your teeth. They'll just carve your face to pieces with their forearm. Just like, oh, I'm choking this guy out. It's like, no, you, you're just shattering my skull. But mm-hmm. if you show them what a blood choke is and you align it properly on the carotid and the, and the jugular, then guess what? When they compress your, your neck, it's just a blood choke. You can go to sleep, no problem. It's not a crank. They're not cranking on your cervical spine. Mm-hmm. And that can be very direct. You can be very like <laughs> pissed off when you say it, but it's an act of kindness because it's like, dude, I want the guys in our gym to not be injured. I want them not, to not be bummed out when you're there, you know, because you have to pair up with random people. So there's certain people where anytime you pair up with them, you're like, oh, great. You know, it's like that eye roll. And you, you especially if this, if you care about somebody new in jujitsu, you don't want him to be that guy. You don't want him to be that dude that everybody who rolls with them is just like, gosh, darn it. I have to, you know, mm-hmm. like, yeah, you know, I could talk for days about this, but that's, you know, that's when you tell the guy, you know what, I'm, I'm going to go get a drink of water or I'm going to stretch. And then you wait for them to pair up with someone who doesn't know. And then you just find a, a chill part. But that's, I'd rather fix the situation than just avoid it, man. Because in the gym, it'll hurt other people if you don't fix it. You know? Yeah, you're just kicking the can, right? What would you tell people? How can they improve their resilience? Yeah. Self care, but at the same time, pursue difficult, painful situations. So you you balance self care, crappy situation, self care recharge, crappy situation, over and over again. Whether it's a long run, whether it's you know operating in 125 degree temperature in a full kit, whether it's fasting, I don't know. Just pick something that sucks and that pushes you. But then afterwards, work on that recovery part. That's where your your bandwidth for resilience increases. Yeah, I love that that last part, the recharge. That's I think that's the part that a lot of people forget. You know, we got yep. when we're recording this, we're just before the new year and resolutions and people they get really motivated, but they don't have the discipline and sometimes that means toggling down and being aware yep. so that you can keep the long game going. All right. So, we talked about mentorship, coaching. What would you say to someone cuz this is something that I've heard several times through my life in different industries and different groups, but People are like, I don't, I don't have a mentor. No one's taking mm-hmm. me under their wing. What do you say to that person? Will you be my dad? No, that's mm-hmm. uh, that's what I struggled with. Find people who you are man, envious of. Like, kind of lean into your envy, but don't use it to be toxic. Use it to go com- compliment that person. If you see somebody with the muscles you want, go up to them and just compliment their workout and ask for pointers. If you see somebody who's, you know, a the best special forces, whatever it is, you know, special operations, Navy SEAL, Green Beret, whoever you have in your hometown, go up to them and say, hey, I, I want to be like you. Just be around them. But what I'm saying is be intentional. 
Be intentional about filtering for the type of person, whoever it is, that inspires you. It could be anything. I don't care if it's interpretive dance and ballet or finger painting or playing the violin or shooting or MMA fighting. Whatever it is that kind of like gets you stoked neurologically and you're, you're curious about it, pursue conversations with that person. And if you're ready to pull the trigger, just straight up ask them, will you be my mentor? Will you're, you're focusing a lot of energy to helping people be better and be more positive. How can people frame their lives to be more positive in, in all this negativity and toxicity, whether it's the media or just the circles you're around? You know, we kind of spoke to a little bit of that earlier, but what comes to mind for you? Filter out the noise and be very cautious and be curious about what you're letting in your mind, you know, because there's so much out there that's like fast food. It's just fast food. It's just instant gratification. You look for the steak. You know, look for the, the good stuff. I love that. And look for the eat. steak and eggs, man. Get that nutrition. Yeah. yeah. But here's the big thing, dude. What You said a great word. You said a brilliant word. It's called framing. But look for the reframe. So you take a situation that sucks. You reframe it. Why is it a good situation? You pursue messages and you pursue data and information, objective data, like be as objective as possible. Find truth about that situation and grow through it that's that's huge don't just listen to the mainstream whatever you know you got to be careful about that i love that man and dan i really want to respect your time I, we've covered a lot of ground i'd love to have you back to speak about more specific topics but yeah thank you for sharing some of your story all the work you've been doing can you tell the listeners where they can find you where they can access your website your books and what's to come with you combatpsych.com. Writing a few more books. Have some full journeys ahead of me. I'm still not done being physical and being tactical. I'm just trying to piece together a couple different stepping stones. Right, now. I love our nation. Serve a little bit more in, in some various capacities. Yeah, I'm hoping to kind of build out the website a bit more, offer some more resources, and create some some meaningful conversations in the future on mental health and all the fun ways to do it. No doubt there's so much work that you're doing in the service of others, not just through your, your writing and your work and coming on here and the litany of podcasts that you're popping up on. So uh, keep it up and I'm excited to see what's next for you, man. Thanks so much, Dan. Thanks, bro. Thank you for tuning into another episode of Blue Grit Radio. As always, support this community by subscribing, giving us a five-star review and following, liking and sharing posts on Blue Grit Wellness on Instagram. You can reach me there or email me at bluegritwellness at gmail.com. Be well and stay gritty.